Hello, Dr. Mason. We're back for Unit 4 of our Contemporary World History course here at Waldorf University uh, Online. And I think uh, we're continuing to do uh, kind of uh, some pretty good work. There's some things I really like uh, that I'm seeing. A lot of you are uh, really taking some steps forward in your analysis. Um, there's some things I think we can uh, continue to improve across the board, especially when it comes to uh, research and implementing that research. Um, I want to see uh, really a focus on uh, pulling in high quality sources to build your credibility this week um, as we got uh, three challenges again um, that are going to help uh, bring us into the Cold War. Um, we're going to uh, get into some international politics, and we often think about the Cold War uh, in the context of the United States and the USSR, which is undoubtedly fair. Um, and uh, on the discussion board, you'll maybe uh, take a look at that. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the United Nations and uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, um, or uh, kind of American economic abroad. Um, and I want you to think about those three things and determine what was the most significant change to global power dynamics following World War II. Now, those things are relatively uh, interrelated with each other. The United Nations, uh, NATO, and U.S. foreign aid all uh, serve some similar goals. But... Uh, I want you to be thinking about uh, which is most significant. So uh, in order to do that, I, on the discussion board, again, be bringing in uh, your unique perspective, but also please do a little bit of research uh, and underwrite your analysis by improving your own cre credibility by pulling some things uh, in. I know uh, most of us probably have a good familiar with the basics of uh, NATO or the United Nations, um, and we'll get some of that from the text. But again, be thinking about uh, how you can underwrite your own credibility by bringing in some of these other sources, um, and then pairing that with your analysis and perspective to uh, put together a pretty good post. The other thing on the discussion board um, I'm starting to notice is uh, some of our second posts are really, really weak. Um, and if you're doing that, uh, it's important to remember that half of your grade on the discussion board each week is for the first post, half is for the response to the classmate. And if all you're saying in that second post is, good job, I like what you did there, I agree with you, you're not contributing anything uh, to the conversation in a really meaningful way, um, and your scores will continue to slide as uh, that expectation for me gets a little bit higher as we're going through the course. Um, I think uh, as we all get kind of acclimated, I like to uh, make it a little bit easier, but as we get going, I do expect that you're going to continue to develop on those discussion boards. So really be thinking about uh, not just uh, how you can build that analysis and credibility in your first initial post, but also when you respond to your classmates, bring something to the table that's meaningful um, in order to get all those points. All right, so then you have another short assessment again. Uh, these, uh, I'm continuing to see the same trends uh, where a couple of you took a real step forward last week and uh, I enjoyed seeing um, that you thought about it beyond just the minimum. If you try to get to 75 words, um, and that's the only way, uh, that's the only guiding principle of how you're developing your analysis. I don't think you're usually putting together a very good response. And I've seen that uh, across the board in this class. And I understand it's about uh, getting it done and doing some of those things. But uh, this week, you got to talk about what issues and historical trends have most influenced countries in the Western Hemisphere since the close of World War II. Um, and your response needs to be 75 words in length at a minimum. So uh, in order to do this, uh, you probably have to identify a couple of the trends talked about in the book and then compare and contrast them and talk about what is going to be most significant. To do that in uh, 75 words is an incredibly tall task, and I think uh, in order to do it well um, and get full credit, you're probably going to have to develop uh, some of that analysis beyond 75 words. Um, so as you do that, uh, again, be thinking about uh, making a statement. Um, and in this, uh, you're probably going to have to identify at least two trends and then compare and contrast them um, to prove which is most significant. In order to prove that, you're going to need some evidence. So uh, be thinking about what you can pull out of the textbook as you're reading. Uh, be thinking about maybe what other sources you might need to uh, round that out and make that happen. Uh, but be, make sure you're putting your best foot forward. Then uh, we got a little bit different uh, academic scholarly challenge in the Unit 4 PowerPoint presentation. So uh, you're going to create at least eight slides that answer uh, a couple of different questions. First, <coughs> how did the cultural, uh, culture and society of the United States or of the states in Eastern Europe differ from those in Western European countries? Uh, so uh, to do this again, we got four steps that are going to help guide us through this process. First, I want you to take an Eastern European country. Usually what we call, talk about is Warsaw Pact countries, uh, countries that are usually uh, satellite states of uh, the USSR during uh, this post-World War II era, as well as uh, one Western European country. So the easiest way to do this is to pick a Warsaw Pact country and a NATO country and then compare and contrast them. Um, and just uh, start uh, finding some basic facts, gathering some information, um, and then comparing them uh, and uh, looking at continuities and changes during this period. Uh, so 
continuities and changes can tie into all sorts of different things. I usually think of them as objective in history, uh, where anybody has to agree uh, that a change is a change. If a company was uh, a capitalist democratic state or a monarchy before World War II, and as they come into this post-war era, they're all of a sudden a communist uh, command economy state, that's a change. If a country was a capitalist democracy before World War II, and then they are a capitalist uh, democracy after World War II, that's a continuity. Um, looking at those things, I think, can be really useful in guiding our research as we put things together. Then um, you're going to find a couple of uh, print primary sources, as we're pretty used to. I think we're doing a good job with this uh, in our other assignments to uh, help back that. Uh, those primary sources are the critical uh, kind of components historians use to uh, can build their analysis. Then I want you to find two scholarly sources. Uh, this is not uh, like our Wikipedia tertiary sources. Our, uh, a lot of you are pulling in like uh, crap, uh, like encyclopedias from the internet like Britannica. Um, be thinking about a scholarly audience. The easiest way to do this is to go uh, to the Waldorf Online Library and uh, be thinking about three questions. First, who wrote it? Uh, second, who published it? And then third, why you should listen to them. And after the first two questions, a lot of times that'll answer itself. So you're looking for somebody with uh, expertise, not just a, a regular journalist. Um, that is somebody that's just writing things for general public consumption, I want you to be finding somebody that's spent uh, a lot of time developing their expertise in the same way that we have all have things that we know about. Some of you uh, that are like firefighters or in the military, I understand what you do for a living. My opinion on it isn't uh, something that your commanding officer uh, would uh, like consider uh, of any kind of value. And that's maybe a way to think about this. Think about uh, how uh, the person writing it has specific expertise that can build your own credibility. Uh, second, think about who published it. A lot of times these are gonna be published by uh, academic presses. That's the easiest way to do it. Be looking for a blank university press, whether that's Oxford, whether that's uh, Duke, whether it's University of North Carolina, whatever it might be. Um, be thinking about who published it and what their intended goal is. If the goal is to sell uh, publications like uh, a newspaper or a general trade book, that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for something that's written to advance scholarly discourse and finding an academic publisher is the easiest way to do that. Uh, third, uh, why you'd want to listen to them should be evident after the first two questions, but uh, be thinking about that as well. Um, then you can draw conclusions, uh, create uh, your PowerPoint, put that together, um, put in a title page and a reference page in addition to the eight slides of content you need there. Um, and then uh, be thinking about uh, kind of uh, APA style and some of that other stuff. Um, there is a PowerPoint basics guide under the syllabus schedule document that can help you um, to think about creating PowerPoint presentations, how to do that in a quality way. But if you do have questions, make sure you're reaching out. As always, I'm here to help you uh, however I can. I mean, I think uh, a lot of you are doing a good job reaching out with some of that stuff. So if you do have questions, uh, make sure you're getting in touch. Otherwise, uh, I appreciate the uh, hard work you put into the class so far. I look forward to the great things you're going to do this week. Good luck.